article was, God resigns after discovery of OT, <laughs> of the Old Testament. God resigns after discovery of the Old Testament. It is obviously satirical. I have a little bit of it here. Um, succumbing to public outcry after the shocking discovery of the Old Testament. Written by himself, God announced he would be stepping down effective immediately. But further down, God apologizes. I was once a young, edgy God, he says, inexperienced and full of wrath. I've grown up a lot since then. Well, it's hard, isn't it? Isn't it hard? If you haven't wrestled with the justice and the righteousness and the condemnation of God as a believer, as someone else, just everyone, right? If you haven't wrestled with that issue, maybe you're totally checked out. <laughs> you know, you just, you're not even thinking about it whatsoever because every Christian, I think, wrestles with the, the justice of God. How can he be like this? Just to think and to take a moment to consider like hell. How, how does such a place exist? And, and how do we explain how God doesn't even seem remotely reluctant to dispense justice? We, we don't find God being remote about being a judge in the Bible or, or regretting that. How do we deal with a God like that? Well, how most pastors deal with a God like that is they avoid reading the Old Testament entirely, okay? Um, we're, not just, we're not going to even go there. This first half, that was the bad half. Thank goodness we got to the good half where God is, again, merciful. Never mind revelations, we won't go there. But not us. At this church, we don't want to shy away from what God has said to us. And we don't want to make excuses for us. We want to deal with it. We want the whole counsel of what God wants to tell us. So here we are in Nahum. And Nahum is the harshest of the minor prophets. You may think the passages that we read were particularly harsh, but if you read the whole book of Nahum, it's all that way, okay? The whole thing from front to back is harsh and judging, and God seems very angry and even maybe enjoying the fact that this city is going into the pit. Let's just consider the little titles. You guys have titles at the uh, top here. These are not from um, the writer of the Bible. It would just be their summation, the uh, translator's summation of what they think the passage is about. So he here's the summations that I have uh, in my section. Chapter 1 is consuming wrath of God. Chapter 2 is destruction of a wicked city. Chapter 3, ruin imminent and inevitable. So is God the big bully in the sky? Is God the big bully in the sky? No. God is everywhere acting out his love. And that means he's going to dispense justice, actually. Everything that God does comes out of his love character. Everything. And I think the purpose of this book, that it would tell us this morning, is actually... God's compassionate character requires that he definitively judge. God's compassionate character requires that he definitively judge. Does that not make sense to you? When you hear that, do you say, I don't know, what do you mean? Judge, I heard love, isn't that the opposite of love? Well, we're going to find out. Uh, the Bible tells us two things. This book tells us two ideas that I want to look at that are going to show us that, in fact, God isn't out of character judging Nineveh, and that actually in some sense, in a very real sense, this is an act of compassion. Well, how could that be? We'll take a look at it. Two ideas that I want to look at. The first is consequences of wasted grace. Consequences of wasted grace. The second thing is protection of the beloved. Protection of the beloved. So let's begin with wasted grace, shall we? consequences of wasted grace um you'll remember that i said a number of weeks back when we uh when we talked about jonah 
if you were there for that, I said that this book is the part two of the book of Jonah. Uh, I said, we're going to find out what happens. <laughs> you, you may get the feeling that it may not end as nicely as it could have, right? Uh, and so what happened here? Jonah came, Jonah preached, and there was this amazing turnaround in this city of Nineveh. By the way, it's about eight square miles, tons of people in this city, huge city of the ancient world, gigantic population. Nineveh, uh, Jonah comes to it, he preaches, and he doesn't say much, but it doesn't matter. God wants them to repent. They do. They repent in droves. Well, what happens after that? Then what? What happened is a story that continues in our world over and over and over again. And that is that Jesus has his heyday, a time when he is known and worshipped in mass. Uh, for this country, that would have been maybe 250 years ago. And then it starts to wane. It starts to dim. And... Pretty soon it's not as big of a deal. Pretty soon it's not the right thing to do. Pretty soon the country says, no, we're secular. We don't, we don't believe any of that that we used to believe. We've repented of that. <laughs> We've moved on. And so uh, we understand this, right? <laughs> Think about uh, Europe, right? You have these beautiful, gigantic, huge cathedrals. And there's like three people in them. It's like a tomb, and people are taking those buildings and saying, this would be a wonderful music venue, or this would be a, a nice, expensive flat that's being converted. What happened is what happened to Nineveh. Yeah, they were entirely sincere in their repentance, but it took literally one single generation to forget what God had done. One generation. How do I know that? Well, you'll see that in just a moment on this next little screen I have. We'll take a look at that in a second. Um, but before we do, thinking about the importance of passing on to the next generation our, the love of our great God. This is what has been missing from all of these generations and all of these nations. They hold on to God for some time, but then they don't, they don't pass it on. And so can I just put it to us? Let's tell the young people about Jesus. Don't think that they're automatically going to get it from church. I'm told that I'm rather boring. <laughs> we need to tell them. Tell them what Jesus has done for you. Let them know that you absolutely believe in him, that he's not your fairy tale friend. Share the Bible. Read the Bible with them. Show them that this is important. Pass on to the next generation, or it might be the last generation, just like Nineveh. So now let's take a look at Nineveh and this timeline we have. So in 770 BC, Jonah preaches to Nineveh. There's a big turnaround. There's even a chance that one of the gates is actually named after Jonah. We don't know that for sure, but there's a pretty good chance. Yonak Gate in Assyria, named in his honor. So they have this huge moment of, of repentance, and it doesn't last at all. Fifty years later, what are they doing? They're attacking Israel, and they wipe out ten tribes of the twelve tribes of Israel. They resettle them elsewhere. Those people stop becoming Jewish. They, they are now scattered among the nations. And so it, it's a stark turnaround, isn't it? And from there, it just gets worse. 20 years after that, a guy named Sennacherib, who is the, the king of Assyria, he attacks Jerusalem, intending to raise it to the ground. And, and, and he talks to Hezekiah from the wall, and what he says to Hezekiah is, your God is nothing. I'm bigger than all the gods, and I'm certainly bigger than your God. Your God can't save you. Your God can't help you. Which is severely ironic, since he would have known about what had taken place with Jonah that 70 years earlier. Almost undoubtedly. And he receives a letter that night from a prophet named Isaiah, by the way. And in that letter it says, your, your army is going to be destroyed because you rage against me. 
And that's what happens actually during the night. An angel of the Lord comes out and the whole army is toast. In the morning he wakes up and he flees back to Assyria like a dog with a tail between its leg. And you can read about that at the British Museum, by the way. There's a little cylinder that says, I surrounded Israel and then I left. <laughs> Which normally what you say is, I took away this many captives and I got this amount of plunder and I ransacked the city and he just says, I just left. And a number of years later, his uh, kids kill him. You read about it in 2 Kings. But you would think after that, that there would be a heart of repentance for this city, wouldn't there? We came up against the living God, the living God who has shown us mercy, and he's real, and we lost. We need to turn to him. But instead, they double down. They get a bigger army. If you read uh, the, the annals of this time about the history, you'll find that the kings that came after this king are very intent on rebuilding all of the pagan shrines that they had and making the army bigger. And about 50 years after that, they go and they sack Thebes in Egypt, which is a huge accomplishment, but more of the same. And then after that, between now and when Nineveh falls is when this book has been written. So here's the question. What will God do with someone who rejects and rejects and rejects and rejects him? I'm not talking about the person that doesn't know that's on the island somewhere fictitiously. I'm talking about the person that receives the word of the Lord. They hear it. They know what it is. They've been told, they've even gotten a glimpse of God's compassion on them, but it doesn't enter their heart. And that's an important question, isn't it? Because many people know of God, and many people make an attempt to come to church every once a year. They sit in the pews, they understand a bit of the theology, they even say, God, thank you that life has gone the way it's gone somewhat. Although I'm not excited about this part, at least I can thank you for that, I guess. But there's no commitment there's no trusting in Jesus. There's no turning from sin. They just kind of keep going. What is God to do? Well, we're going to read what he's going to do here. Let's read uh, chapter 1, verse 4. Actually, this would be verse 2. I'm sorry, verse 3. I'll get it right. The Lord is slow to anger but great in power. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. So that should sound familiar to our ears. Um, Nahum is quoting Exodus 34. You will have remembered that God, uh, no, uh, Moses says, God, I, I want to see your glory. And it says the Lord came down in a, in a cloud and he proclaimed who he really was. He proclaimed his name. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. But we'll notice that Nahum has a different focus. But let's take a look at that and see how this might be different from what we find there and yet similar. So Exodus 34, if you'll turn there and just keep your finger right here uh, so you can come back. Exodus 34. And we'll read the section that is being quoted. And this would be 6 and 7. He passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. Wait a minute. What did Nahum do there? He skipped all the mercy bits, right? The Lord is compassionate and merciful and forgiving wickedness and sin and all sorts of bad things that people do. He's able to forgive it all and he wants to have a relationship. Nahum says, oh, never mind on that. Skip that off. Let's go to his power. Actually, he says first, God's been patient. But he's powerful. He's no pushover. God's no pushover. And he says he will not acquit the guilty he will not acquit the guilty nahum skips off all god's compassion why because they passed on god's compassion 
And when you pass on God's compassion, the only thing you have left in his character is his justice. When you pass on God's compassion, the only thing you have left is God's justice. It's like those cartoons that have the bomb and they've got the very long fuse, right? And the fuse is slowly going down. And the idea is before the fuse gets down to nothing, you need to do something. Like don't be there or cut it or do something, but don't be there when it hits nothing. This life is our opportunity to know God's compassion and his love and his mercy before it ticks down to naught. But when it reaches not, God is saying, this is part of my character. This is part of my love. It's actually this jealous desire for you that was unmet. And it's judgment. And I would tell you nothing but what God says to you. And this is what he says to us. I have a justice side. I do tick down to not. And there is jealous desire for you that is unfulfilled. And now I will call you to account for it. But it's really, it's not as if this is some strange part of God. Like he has this love part, but then this weird wrath part. It's actually, it's not like a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde sort of thing. Like we hope we get the Dr. Jekyll side of God and not the Mr. Hyde side because he's mean. It's like it's the same love, just unfulfilled. Uh, We can see this. Uh, Let's take a look at uh, chapter 3, verses uh, 4 and 5. Chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. All because of the wanton lust of a prostitute, alluring the mystery of sorceries who enslaved nations by her prostitution and people by her witchcraft. I am against you, declares the Lord. I'll lift your skirt over your face. I will show the nations your nakedness and the kingdoms your shame. Whoa, interesting, very sharp. What's going on here? Well, what's going on is God is describing Nineveh as an unfaithful wife who's been caught in adultery again and again and again so that her title would be prostitute. And see, this is what's interesting about love because everybody wants to say that God is love. Even if you were to go up on the hill and talk with people who don't believe in God, if they were to start thinking about what God is, they would probably say, well, he's probably loving, right? But they, they mean kind of this lovey-dovey kind of, you know, it's, it's like an emotion, and that's about it. It's, that's what they mean when they talk about God being loving. Uh, we, were, uh, <laughs> we were watching Pride and, and Prejudice last night, and, um, which is great, by the way. But the Americans have an extra scene added on to the movie, okay? So in the movie, they don't kiss. There's no closeness. There's no affection. And this is altogether wrong in the estimation of the Americans, you know. Uh, So entirely out of the book, it's not in the book at all. You know, there's this really cutesy scene where they're talking and it's kissy-kissy, you know. And this is how it ends, right? This is how the book is. Uh, It doesn't have any of that. But the Americans need it because that's love, Love is what Mr. Mr. Darcy does for Elizabeth beforehand. All the things he does to take care of her. These actions. That's what love is. It's not this emotional thing. It's not the kiss at the end. It's the heart giving for someone else. This is what God is. And that also means that since it's like a marital relationship, it's absolutely right for God to want justice when that love is denied so think about this imagine that a woman um, is caught in adultery with tons and tons of partners she's totally unashamed her her husband says i I know you've been doing this i've been told that you've been up to this right and uh and he says good for you that was awesome that you did that i'm so happy that you self-actualized i hope that was a really good time and then he doesn't that that's it that's the end of the conversation we would say if a husband said that to his wife that husband actually never loved his wife in the first place. That's not love. And you see, in the very same sense, God cannot look past the injustice of turning away from him. Do you see it? Do you see it? 
God's love is so great and true, it becomes righteous jealousy when it's denied. And so we can waste our time by not coming to him. So that's the first point. Real consequences to wasted grace. I was thinking this week about how horrible it would be to have a church of people and that somebody in this audience would say, or somebody who comes here on a regular basis would say, this is just all for show for me. I'm just paying my dues. I'm making everybody happy and not actually trust in the love that God has for them and not take note that God is saying, be in a relationship with me. It's everything you were made for, but also there's responsibility at the end of that. May that not be us. Let's take a look now at the second point, which is the protection of the beloved. The protection of the beloved. The, the major you, uh, description of God in this book is an avenging God. God is an avenging God. Now, we have uh, a movie out called The Avengers, which is fairly positive for the term avenging. But what exactly does that mean? Is it a negative thing? An avenger, simply put, is someone who is going to seek justice for somebody else who does not have justice. See, seeking justice for someone who does not have justice. So to illustrate this fact, let's just imagine, and this happens all over the world all the time, that there are wars going on and the, the, the winning side enters this innocent village. No one there is even involved in the war. But they're in, they enter this village, they, they soon set the place ablaze, they're taking all the men and the older women, the older men and the children, and they're just hanging them. And right in the middle of this is this young lady, and she is screaming out in pain and agony as people are passing by, looting the places, taking this, taking it. No one notices the woman screaming, or perhaps they don't care. That scream pierces God's heart. Where does that injustice go? It goes to the foot of God. And because he cares, because he hears the suffering, because he hears the pain, he cannot fail to act. So the reason that God is judging isn't because he likes to judge, because he just, he just loves the, the job. The reason God judges is because he loves the people that are being hurt i think every judge knows this judges when they have to stand in judgment in a court case they actually understand that this isn't the most pleasant thing that they could do but they need to look out for these hurting people and this is god's heart it lands at his feet he won't let it pass he is an avenger and so he would rather say, stop it to these people doing these things, and I'm calling to you account, than let it continue and hurt those that he cares deeply for and hurt his beloved. Um, you know, I think people are always happy to hear a foolish man continue to be foolish, you know? You're in a conversation, somebody starts saying something stupid, and, you know, you're, you're quite inclined to just let that continue. Go ahead, spout your folly. But then if that person turns around and starts to have a go at your wife or your husband, you're like, oh, no, you didn't. <laughs> now, judgment, right? Have you ever had that happen? Oh, you just messed with the wrong person right there. That was fine for you to say whatever came to your heart and be as idiotic as you wanted, but don't you dare touch the one I love. And that's what God does here. That's what God does here. In fact, the book of uh, Nahum, it literally means, the word Nahum means compassion. Now that's ironic, because the whole book is filled with none but judgment, right? Who exactly is getting the compassion in this book? And the answer is all the people who don't have to deal with Nineveh anymore, because God has removed that issue so that there can be peace. God judges because he loves us. God judges because he loves us and others have been hurting us and he will not let it pass. He will call to judgment. And so that's why God is so unabashed in his judgment. That's why he's so unabashed because he's unabashed in his love for us. It is God's 
intense love for you that doesn't make it okay when someone hurts you. That's what's going on. Let's take a look at this in the book, actually. So let's read chapter 1, verse 7. The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust him. But with an overwhelming flood, he will make an end of Nineveh. He will pursue his foes into the realm of darkness. You get the idea? I'm good. I'm, I'm trustworthy. Come to me. I'll protect you. Oh, here come the bad guys. I'm going to pursue them away. Right? I won't let them hurt you. Because I'm good. Let's uh, look at uh, verse 14. The Lord has given a command concerning you, Nineveh. You'll have no descendants to bear your name. I'll destroy the images and the idols that are in the temples of your gods. I will prepare your grave. You are vile. Look, there on the mountains, the feet of one who brings good news, who proclaims peace, celebrate your festivals, Judah, fulfill your vows. No more will the wicked invade you. They'll be destroyed completely. So we get the picture, right? God is judging them. But why is he judging them? So that they will no longer come and harass those he loves. They'll never enter the city again. And what that means is, by the way, literally, the Ninevites are not going to come to Jerusalem and cause problems anymore. When it says you'll no longer forever, that, that's what it means. They're not going to hurt you anymore. For I have judged them for your sake. Now, this is interesting uh, because it doesn't actually say the word Nineveh in the first chapter at all. I know it says the word Nineveh in, the, in your Bibles, but that's not actually in the Hebrew at all. It kind of leaves it open, although in the second chapter it does mention Nineveh and then it mentions Assyria in chapter 3. But it's left blank, and I think the reason it's left blank is because God is saying, I'm not just like this with Nineveh. I'm like this with every nation on the earth. This is how I do business. I am a just God all around. You know, um, it's sad what has happened in history, but nation after nation who has got the technological advantage and all sorts of cool weapons that are new and different than their neighbors, then take those things and they plunder their neighbors, usually to get rich. Okay, America is very guilty of this. I'll, I'll go ahead and throw my own nation under the bus. But I have a feeling I'm not the only nation in that boat. God takes notice. God will repay. God will never allow one thing to go. He is an avenging God. And it's because he loves us so sincerely. Now, if you think about that, there's a problem, isn't there? The problem is, we do some bad stuff, don't we? We've hurt other people, haven't we? And that is a serious deal to God. In fact, so serious that God is like, either I'm going to punish them or I'm going to punish Jesus. That's my option, punish them or punish Jesus. But I'm punishing someone. I will not let this pass, for I love them. I cannot let it pass. And you know what we ought to say to that? I know it's a nasty business of judgment, and we don't like saying that people are going to be judged, but what I say to a God who will never let these things go because he loves us that much, I, I say amen. That's the God I want to worship. I don't want to worship the God that I tell you can't do this, and you can't do that, and you have to be a lovey-dovey feeling. That's it. I want to worship the real God, the God of justice. God of justice. So that's our lesson. God's compassionate character requires he definitively judge. Have you asked yourself, why is God a judge? I'll give you the answer, because he loves you. He loves you so sincerely that to not judge would be to, de to demure his love. To, to, to bring it down and to say, ah, oh, it's not a big deal, but it is. So I think what Jesus is asking us this morning to do is, will you remember my kindness 
That's important. Remember my kindness. Remember my love and my mercy. But don't forget my justice too. Don't forget. And the, the way that the scripture puts this in Romans chapter 12, I think, is oh, the, the kindness and the severity of God. The kindness and the severity. He loves us so much. But there's responsibility, isn't there? There's justice. Three ways I think we can say yes to God when he says, remember that my kindness and my justice. The first is, let's not sit on the fence about God's mercy and God's love. And it goes something like this. I think the gospel is true. I, I think that God really did send Jesus to die, but I want to have fun, or I want this, or I want that, or I just, once I get my things done, then I'll come to God, but not until then, because I might lose out on all the fun that I'm about to have, which isn't that fun anyway, if you're wondering. Say no to that, and just come to the mercy of God now. You'll do better anyway. It'll go better. Don't sit on the fence, please. You might find that time is up before you think it will be. The second thing is, we need to pass on this love, don't we? We've got to tell the young generation, this is what is wrong with our society at the moment and Christianity, that we're not passing this on to our children. We're just not passing it on. And if we don't pass it on, then in 20 years, we can expect Christianity to be next to dead. The children need to hear about the Lord. The children need to hear. And I, I think I just mentioned earlier that we're looking for people to help with the young people, right? How important is this to God? It's important enough that in this book, this is the major issue. Don't pass that up. Pour into the next generation. Read if you, if you have a family. Read the Bible with your kids. That says the world to them. What do you say? Like, God is boring. That's what they're thinking because you never take any time to address the question at all. So then they're like, well, if you think God is boring, why would I think God is anything but boring? That doesn't make sense. And then off they go to find something interesting that the world will offer them. The third point, uh, God is just, but we need to understand that actually he is, he's going to judge. He's so loving. But let's not deceive ourselves. We know people who are resisting God, and they tell themselves, I'll never have to face judgment for it. I, I guarantee you. They are telling themselves, God doesn't exist. I'll never have to face judgment. I'll never have to see that throne. I'll never have to see Jesus, who I despise. And they are dead wrong. And just because they feel that way doesn't change anything. And you should not go along with that. You should not say, I will conspire with you to ignore the judgment that is coming. Pray for them. Pray for them with all of your heart. Seek them out. Tell them that the Lord is good. Tell them that the Lord is just.